turn it over to Melissa Faust, who is going to talk about Medicaid and whether or not Kansas should or should not expand as part of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, depending on which uh, name you want to use to describe it. So take it away, Melissa. All right, thank you very much. Okay, move over here. Um, so we are entering now our third hour, so if you, and I'm about to talk to you about Medicaid, so if you need to get more caffeine or sugar or, or what have you, I won't blame you at all. Um, so to date we've been talking about things that are specific to uh, struggles that Kansas has had ongoing, things that Kansas has already done in terms of its tax policy, its spending policy education. But as we move into talking about um, Medicaid expansion, specifically Medicaid expansion as contemplated as, uh, as part of the 2010 Federal Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, popularly known as Obamacare, um, this is something that the state of Kansas has not done. And so in this instance, um, I think it is useful to turn and take a look at the um, coming up now on nearly three dozen states who have already expanded, look at their experiences, look at what the current state of play is both in those states as well as at the federal level in terms of how they're dealing with their side of Medicaid policy uh, to try and draw some conclusions about um, what direction Kansas should go on what is obviously a very critical question when we talk about the amount of money involved here. Um, so. Past Medicaid expansions, what have we learned from states who have already expanded? What has happened in the past since uh, it's been several years now since Medicaid expansion took full effect in 20, 2014? Um, that Medicaid expansion um, through Obamacare, uh, of course, is an expansion of uh, Medicaid benefits, not just to the traditional population, which is um, uh, more vulnerable individuals, so we're talking about low-income elderly, uh, low-income children, the disabled, pregnant mothers, to um, the expansion population, which is um, uh, comprised almost entirely of able-bodied working-age adults. So, uh, first thing that we've learned from other states, more people enrolled and projected in Medicaid expansion by a lot. So we had uh, 17 states in 2014 who issued projections about how many people they expected to enroll in Medicaid expansion its first year. We um, uh, compare those numbers to what actual enrollment was, and across those 17 states, 91% more people enrolled than was anticipated. So if you're states and you're going in and planning that we need to have X number of doctors on our networks to make sure that we have network adequacy, we need to be planning for X amount of administrative costs per enrollee, if you're getting nearly twice the people that you anticipated, that's obviously going to create some issues, both for access and for cost. Per enrollee costs are higher than anticipated. This was also a little bit of a surprise. In the first three years of Medicaid expansion, individual enrollee costs were 76% higher than anticipated, so over half, again, more expensive than um, the federal government projected per enrollee. This is also important to note because one of the selling points of Medicaid expansion, one of the reasons that it was going to be affordable, was that the expansion population was anticipated to be much, much healthier than the traditional expansion population would cost a lot less. Um, on aggregate, that's still true. However, the fact that individual enrollees within the expansion population cost so much more per enrollee than was anticipated is also a problem um, from a budgetary standpoint. Access to health care providers is poor. This is actually something that predates Medicaid expansion but has been exacerbated by Medicaid expansion. Uh, so back in 2013, so a year before the um, before the Medicaid expansion under Obamacare took effect, the Inspector General of the Federal Department of Health and Human Services um, decided to test network adequacy across states. Um, most states have moved from a fee-for-service model to an MCO model, managed care organization. That's what Kansas has now with CanCare. Um, and so these managed care organizations contract with the state and basically administer Medicaid on behalf of states but are private insurance companies. And they provide lists of providers and they say, here's the network, here's how many providers we have who are able to take new Medicaid patients. So what the Inspector General's Office at HHS did was take those lists of doctors who were supposed to be accepting new Medicaid patients and call and tried to schedule appointments for a new Medicaid patient with each of these offices. What they found in 2013 was only half of the doctors on those lists were actually available to take new patients. Wait times were extremely long. 
A quarter of the providers had wait times of over a month, and one out of 10 had wait times of over two months. They said a lot of obstetricians that they checked with couldn't get a woman in until two or three months, meaning that she would not receive prenatal care in her first trimester for pregnancy through Medicaid. Um, and I have this grab quote, of course, from a pediatrician that they interviewed as part of this, basically saying that it's nearly impossible to find specialty care for Medicaid patients with very common chronic illnesses like diabetes and asthma, which, if left untreated, become extremely expensive to treat in the emergency room. Um, those issues have continued to worsen since we expanded um, Medicaid to millions of additional enrollees without necessarily doing much of anything to try and increase that provider supply in those networks in terms of availability. So that's where you get situations like what we have in California where you've got a large civil rights lawsuit against the state for providing substandard care in their Medicaid program and a lot of that comes down to long wait times. Um, only a small portion of Medicaid funds directly benefit enrollees. So some of the best research that we have about outcomes under Medicaid comes from um, the Oregon experiment. You spend any time working in Medicaid policy, you hear about the Oregon experiment a lot. Uh, the reason for that is it is the only good recent data we have that's sterling, standard, random assignment, true experimental data. Um, the reason for that is that Oregon, prior to Medicaid expansion under Obamacare, undertook a voluntary expansion, same type of population as Medicaid expansion under Obamacare, able-bodied, working-age, low-income adults, um, but they basically did it through a lottery system. So researchers were able to come in and take this similar population and track the people who got coverage and the people who didn't and see what the differences were. Um, so obviously a, a huge boon for us in terms of quality research. Um, one of the things that they found from that data set, and we're still getting great studies coming out of that data set, uh, comes from Finkelstein, Hendren, and Letmer, who are researchers at um, Princeton, Harvard, and MIT. What they found was that for every dollar spent in Medicaid, approximately 20 to 40 cents of that dollar reaches the enrollee in the form of a direct benefit. Uh, the rest of it represents transfers to implicit providers of insurance and some other things. So there's obviously some huge inefficiencies going on in the Medicaid system, and we're not seeing a, uh, we're seeing a lack of funding getting directly to the intended recipient, which is obviously problematic. Woodwork effect is real and is really devastating to state budgets. This is one piece that uh, states have an, a particularly hard time predicting and has had a particularly big immediate impact um, in causing state budget problems. So for the first three years of Medicaid expansion in any state, the federal government covers 100% of the costs for newly eligible enrollees. But that's the catch. They only cover 100% of the cost for newly eligible enrollees. However, when the state expands Medicaid and all the hubbub and the news about, hey, there's this new health care benefit available, a lot of people run in, they, they sign up. They, a lot of times, um, uh, some studies in certain states like Kentucky found that um, patients coming into hospitals, about a quarter of them previously had private insurance and moved over into Medicaid. So you get people who had insurance some other way or maybe didn't have insurance. They run in, they sign up, but they were actually already eligible. It doesn't matter if they signed up as part of a Medicaid expansion drive. If they were already eligible, the federal government is only going to be half of their costs. And the number of people who were actually already eligible who came in and signed up for insurance was far more than um, anybody was anticipating. So in the first year of expansion in 2014, uh, there were over 400,000 more individuals who were previously eligible who signed up than were anticipated um, at a cost of an additional around $3 billion, uh, 1.15 of which was borne directly by the states. Expansion has not saved hospital finances. This is another thing that um, we have discussed a lot with folks. Um, obviously, a lot of hospitals, especially in states like Kansas, where you have a lot of rural hospitals, are kind of on hard times. There's been a lot of changes to how health care is delivered. Um, there's been a lot of changes um, just generally to uh, how people finance and receive health care. Um, and hospitals have been impacted by that. And so... Uh, one of the big selling points in a lot of states for doing Medicaid expansion is that hospitals are required in their emergency departments to take on people that um, are, uh, are uh, 
coming in for emergency care regardless of their ability to pay. And so hospitals are gaining a lot of bad debt from people who are uninsured. So the reasoning goes, we'll expand Medicaid, and that will at least ensure that the hospitals will get something for these people, even if it's not that full reimbursement that you would get from private insurance. Well, unfortunately, what we've found in other states that have expanded um, is that bad debt from people who aren't actually insured is increasing because deductibles are increasing. So people are coming in from care, and they have insurance, and they still can't pay. Um, and that's one of the reasons just a little over six months ago, Moody's downgraded um, U.S. not-for-profit and public health care financial outlook to negative. Um, they anticipate that bad debt will increase both in expansion and non-expansion states. Um, and again, as I mentioned in Kentucky, they had significant crowd out effect of people coming into their hospital who weren't previously uninsured. They had been privately insured. And switched over to Medicaid, so the hospitals are actually having that loss on those patients. It's offsetting a lot of the benefits they get from people who are previously uninsured getting covered. So bottom line, it really hasn't been the financial boon that was expected in pretty much all states. Expansion does prioritize the able-bodied over the traditional expansion population. This is another thing that um, has been argued a lot across states. Uh, I think it comes down to a question of just bad incentives in the way that um, funding for Medicaid expansion versus traditional Medicaid is set up. I don't think it's an ill intent sort of thing. It's just a matter of when you've got a population that the federal government is covering 90 to 100 percent of the cost for and a population that the federal government's only covering about half of the cost for, that changes the calculation for states in terms of what they can or can't do with their budgets. So we have situations like um, we see in uh, quite a few expansion states uh, they have thousands of people sitting on waiting lists who were who were already enrolled in uh, Medicaid, were, um, were eligible under the traditional Medicaid program, and are on waiting lists for certain home or community-based services, um, remain on those waiting lists even while at the same time coverage is getting expanded to able-bodied working-age adults. And um, since 2014, at least 21,904 individuals have died while waiting on Medicaid waiting lists in expansion states. This is not a causal statement. Nobody here is saying that all those people died because they remained on these waiting lists. But the fact remains that you had almost 30,000 people who died never receiving care that they were promised as part of Medicaid, while at the same time other people had coverage extended to them. So there's obviously some incentive issues going on there. So where does that bring us to right now? Um, there's a lot of action on the Medicaid front in states. A lot of states are trying to get out in some form or another. Um, more than one in four expansion states has applied for some sort of federal federal waiver to try and roll back their Medicaid expansion program in some way. For the majority of them, this is a Medicaid work requirement. Um, uh, for a couple states like Arkansas and Massachusetts, they requested to roll back eligibility from that 133% of the federal poverty level down to 100% of the federal poverty level. And last year, Ohio lawmakers voted to freeze their Medicaid expansion, just cap enrollment where it was and let people naturally, that natural attrition kind of take care of the issue. Um, of course, Governor Kasich vetoed that. Um, problem being that for all of these states who are now trying to find some way to ramp back their programs, once you expand Medicaid, you're beholden to all of these federal statutes governing what Medicaid expansion means under Obamacare. And any changes you want to make to that, any, any time that you want to try and cap enrollment or cap your expenses, you then have to ask the federal government for permission on how the state spends its money, essentially. Um, so this is, this is the situation that these states are running into. They've asked for permission to do all these things to try and bring their own state budgets under control and aren't getting those permissions granted because of statutory language within the ACA. Um, and so that brings us to an unprecedented amount of um, state budgets are made up of federal dollars now, which creates some control issues for states over their own budgets. Um, we have this. Nice black and white graph from back in 1996 where federal funds made up uh, about one in every four dollars distributed by the states. As of 2016, that had increased to approaching one in three dollars. Um, and that growth is almost entirely Medicaid. Um, and in fact, um, 
you guys just had a conversation about education, education funding. These things seem not related, but a lot of times when you're talking about funding issues, you got one pot that all this is coming out of, all of it affects each other. Um, so we actually see that in a lot of states, specifically I'm thinking of West Virginia, who had a lot of teacher strikes this year and is an expansion state, that Medicaid is actually one of um, the prevailing factors in um, education shrinking as a percentage of state budgets. So as Dave was talking about, um, nominal spending on education hasn't fallen. Like states continue to spend more money on education every year. But as a percentage of their state budgets, education funding is shrinking. And that is something that a lot of people are concerned about. They don't like seeing, you know, down from 25 to 20% to maybe even less than 20% of their state budgets being dedicated towards K through 12. Well, pretty much all that has to do with Medicaid. Uh, so I have this screen grab from the National Association of State Budget Officers, their uh, most recent state expenditure report explaining that Medicaid has risen as a percentage of total state spending growing from 20.5% in 2008, so one out of every $5, um, to an estimated 29% in 2017. So again, we're starting to approach this one out of three territory. At the same time, elementary and secondary education has gone from 22% of total state spending to 19.4%. Um, and they say that the reason for elementary and secondary education representing a smaller share of total state spending is not because of nominal, not because nominal spending has declined, but because its growth rate is slower than the growth in Medicaid spending. So you're just seeing that kind of Pac-Man of, of Medicaid spending kind of growing and, and soaking up those other areas of the budget. And then we also have some in, continuing conversations at the federal level about what to do about Obamacare writ large and especially about Medicaid expansion, which is one of the largest expenditures uh, out of that law. Um, the president's budget this past year, which of course is largely a symbolic measure, but an important signaling mechanism nonetheless, did not include any money for Medicaid expansion. Um, and there's recently been an Obamacare kind of repeal 2.0 effort launched by um, Senator Santorum and, and quite a few um, influential organizations up in D.C. So this is still an ongoing conversation. It's not something that's dead and done and there's no uncertainty left. Obamacare is here in perpetuity exactly as it is now. Not the case. Um, and the uh, Trump administration released Medicaid work requirement guidance saying that states could apply to add work requirements to their Medicaid programs. Some states took this as a sign that, hey, well, if we can slap a wor uh, work requirement on it, then that means it's a conservative Medicaid expansion. We can do that. Um, the fact of the matter is the, the Medicaid work requirement and work requirements and other uh, programs like food stamps and um, cash welfare are designed to get people off of government dependency and back to self-sufficiency. So you don't want to get into a situation where you're expanding an entitlement in order to then apply a work requirement to try and draw people back off that entitlement. Don't expand it in the first place. Um, and again, even with a, a work requirement, which is still actually being tested in the courts, it's being tested in Kentucky right now, so we don't know what the overall outcome on that is even going to be. Um, even with that work requirement, a state's Medicaid expansion under Obamacare is still constrained by Obamacare statute, so you can't cap your enrollment, you can't cap your spending. There's no overall controls. So future, talking about the direction that healthcare is going um, and is Medicaid and particularly Medicaid expansion as a vehicle for giving coverage to able-bodied working age people really the best path forward. So I don't think this is gonna be shocking to anybody, but mandatory federal spending is on an unsustainable path. So back in 1962, uh, one in every four federal dollars was uh, allocated to a mandatory program, meaning that the federal government didn't have any discretion. It was an existing program, and unless they changed the statute surrounding that program, they had to spend that money. Just one in four dollars back in 1962 were spent that way. Um, by 2023, it'll be about uh, two out of every three dollars that the federal government spends, and um, that's obviously an issue for the federal government, something that they have to look at, but when they're looking at targets for that, your three big culprits for mandatory spending are Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. What is the most recent expansion of one of those three programs? Medicaid expansion under Obamacare. So if you think of sort of that last and first out sort of situation, that's your most likely target if you're trying to find ways to decrease your mandatory spending. 
Um, and make no mistake, the federal government will find a way to shift more costs to the states. Um, you can be certain of one thing when it comes to uh, federally and state shared programs. The federal government will find ways to shift costs back to the states. Um, so uh, the Kansas bill, uh, along with uh, a lot of other state bills to expand Medicaid, um, includes safeguards saying that if federal funding falls below its promised 90% match rate, then our Medicaid expansion will just end. Well, beyond the logistical issues with actually doing that, if it were to happen, um, is the fact that the federal government is usually never so straightforward is to just say, we're going to change statute, we're going to decrease our share. They find other ways to do it. Um, one of the ways that they're looking at most closely is state um, and Medicaid provider taxes and fees. The federal government has always hated these. Um, on a bipartisan basis, the Obama administration hated these. Biden called them a scam. The Bush administration hated these. Um, this is something that they're always looking at, trying to find a way uh, to see if they can uh, clamp down on this. This is especially important for Kansas because for the last two years, the bills proposing Medicaid expansion in Kansas funded that expansion with a provider fee. So if that's how the federal government's going to crack down, then that's going to be an issue for the states. So healthcare rests on four pillars, access, choice, quality, and affordability. Um, it's, it's a pretty simple equation on paper, but obviously healthcare is extremely complex and is a unique mix of consumer um, desire and what people's personal goals for their own health is versus what is affordable, what is available, what is accessible. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's a tough equation that relies on provider availability, um, the availability of new and innovative technologies, uh, and a whole host of other um, factors that, frankly, are not contemplated as part of Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is expanding coverage. It's not expanding care, necessarily, as we discussed earlier when it comes to network adequacy in terms of providers, um, wait times for doctor's appointments, all of those things. There are no guarantees as part of, of Medicaid um, to ensure any of those four pillars. And um, so while obviously there's a, a very vulnerable population that is not able-bodied or is not working age that currently relies on Medicaid and we want to try and make it as efficient and cost-effective um, and quality as we can for those folks, there are probably other better solutions, um, hopefully market-based approaches, to helping working-aged, able-bodied adults access health care at prices that they can afford and access quality health care at prices they can afford. Um, there's a lot of innovations out there. Um, Kansas is already really great on direct primary care, actually. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, I was talking with James about earlier, the uh, passed a telemedicine bill this year too. So you guys are already doing a lot of great things on this front to actually do what you need to do in terms of making sure that the path is clear for innovation, for competition, for increased providers. Um, and you just want to keep going down that road. Um, and uh, one, one great resource to look at is um, through the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, which is an economic research center. Um, uh, they released uh, actually their second edition just last week of their Healthcare Openness and Access Project, HOPE for short. Um, and basically what they do is they go through and look at all of the regulations that affect how open and competitive and accessible the state's healthcare market is, um, which obviously has a lot of impacts on affordability as well. And they rank the states. So it's a really great way to kind of see, get a snapshot of what Kansas is doing well what areas it could probably stand to improve. So as you can see, uh, doing really great on provider regulation, um, probably has some work to do on, that's cut off, but pharmaceutical access uh, and medical liability. So there's, there's a lot of state-based things that Kansas can do without having to rely on the federal government or contemplate a massive increase in, um, in federal deficit spending to actually um, make its healthcare market more competitive and more affordable for folks. Uh, so that kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. But if there was anything that kind of piqued your interest or that you had a question about or wanted me to expand on, happy to answer any questions. All right, remember, raise your hands high as uh, if you have questions, it's coming from Medicaid here. Thank you. <clears throat>
Hi, I'm Jack Ayers, uh, not a candidate, but thank you very much for all your information. It's very helpful. I have a question on uh, the slide regarding uh, hospital finances. Mm -hmm. So, uh, really appreciate explaining, and, uh, and I understand that expansion versus non expansion doesn't really have an effect on um, uh, the chain or on the uh, amount of bad debt in the hospital. But I guess, what's, mm -hmm. what's your take on why that bad debt is increasing? And I'm you know, kind of thinking back in my mind about St. Francis and Topeka and Independence. Hospital, you know, hospitals that have closed kind of due to those issues. Kind of wondered what, you know, what is your take on, on why that still goes up? Um, I think there's a, a combination of factors going on. I think uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, um, we were seeing increases in bad debt through low-income individuals who were uninsured, who were using the emergency department as their primary access point for health care. And that had to do with uh, underlying issues that have caused a lot of medical cost inflation in our country. Um, the U.S. spends more per capita on health care costs than any other country in the developed world. And a lot of that has to do with medical inflation, having to do with the way that our third-party payer system is set up, what have you. Um, and so probably Prior to ACA, you just had a lot of folks who um, were uninsured and were going into the emergency department and incurring like these really inflated health care costs for stuff that would have been much less expensive through a primary care provider or something like that. And then post ACA, we're actually seeing a shift, which is one of the things the Moody's report talks about and where the bad debt is coming from. It's not coming as much from people who are uninsured, although there's a pretty sizable population even in expansion states that remains uninsured. Um, we're actually seeing an increase in bad debt from middle income families who are insured. And that has to do with the increase in co-pays and high deductibles with Obamacare plans. Um, so it's kind of a mixture, it's changed over time and we're just kind of seeing a shift in where the primary sources of that bad debt are, are coming from. But a lot of it just has to do with the underlying issues with our healthcare system that have caused prices to be inflated so much in the first place. Thank you, Thank you. I was told that uh, 2019, that Tax penalty would quit on Obamacare if you didn't take it. Is that true? Um, yes. So as part of the twenty um, the twenty eighteen federal tax reform law, one of the pieces of that law was actually that they removed the individual mandate from the ACA, meaning that um, prior to uh, 2018, if you didn't purchase insurance when you went to file your federal income taxes, you had to check a box saying whether or not you were insured. And if you hadn't been insured for more than a certain period over that year, you had to pay a tax penalty or fee or whatever they argued before the Supreme Court that it ended up being. Um, uh, so as of 2018, with, with that change in the federal tax laws, which takes effect next year, um, that question goes away. You don't get penalized if you didn't carry insurance that met ACA guidelines. This will be our last question on Medicaid. Thanks. Uh, Carrie Humphreys again, my wife Susan is running uh, for re-election of the 99th um, Your last slide on page 89, which shows provider regulation, Kansas number mm -hmm. one, and pharmaceutical access, Kansas number 51. Could you just explain how that slide works and maybe use those two as an yeah, example? Yeah, sure. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is the HOPE Index, the Healthcare Openness and Access Project at Mercatus Center, which is um, uh, Dr. Darcy Bryan and a few researchers from Mercatus put this together. The first one was uh, a year and a half or so ago, and they just updated it. So, basically, they have an overall score. They rank everything from one to five, five being the best and one being the worst, and then they have these subcategories. So, they have individual rankings for states for the subcategories as well as an overall score. As you can see, Kansas ranks over overall 26th um, and then in these individual brackets um, and each of these sub indexes has usually uh, around four policies that are included under there that they use as markers some of them um, so for the pharmaceutical access one, for example, a couple of the things that are included under that um, is the availability of certain medications over the counter. Some states have different laws in terms of contraceptives or pseudoephedrine or, or different types of things like that having to be accessed directly through the pharmaceutical versus over the counter. Um, which can act as a barrier to folks. So that's one of the things they talk about. They talk about the ability to um, uh, get or renew prescriptions online. Um, obviously, as we're moving towards telemedicine, um, the ability to do online prescriptions has a, a large amount to do with access. Um, whereas provider regulations, the provider regulation thing includes things like in certain states, um, uh, medical businesses are required to be owned by a person who is a licensed 
um, medical provider. Um, and so obviously that kind of limits what, how you can organize your business if you have a, have a licensed person own it, uh, rather than having maybe a person who specializes in business own the business and hire uh, a licensed medical professional to work in it. Um, so things like that that kind of, and then of course, uh, uh, that also ties into occupational regulation as well. So that's kind of scope of practice concern. So each of those um, individual indices have kind of three or four policies that they use to, to rank that, um, which is available and is bracketed out in their larger study that they released. Thank you very much, Melissa. Mm -hmm.